So about a year ago, I did a whole bunch of videos where I was testing cables like this and various connectors at severe overcurrents to see how big the safety margin might be. And a number of viewers got pretty upset and said things like, well, this is not a valid test. You need to have 120 volts between those wires because everybody knows that voltage times current is power. And since in your tests you've only got 3 or 4 volts between these wires, well, that's not valid. Well, it actually is valid because the heating in the wires is due to the voltage drop along the wire times the current through the wire, not the voltage across the two wires times the current. The voltage across the two wires times the current is the power that's delivered to the load. It better be delivered to the load because if we were losing that power in the cable, we'd be getting no power going to the load. It would be incredibly wasteful and incredibly useless. Now, if you're still doubting it, well, over here we have some nice red cable and that is cable that's intended for 240 volt applications. It's number 12 and rated at 20 amps. Over here I have some nice yellow cable. It's intended for 120 volt applications. It is number 12 wire and it's also rated at 20 amps. So both of these cables are intended for different voltage applications or different voltages between the two wires in them, yet they have the same thickness of wire and have the same ampacity rating of 20 amps. So that's a very practical example. For those of you who want to see the calculations in more details, well at the end of this video I'm going to do a worked example with a schematic diagram so you can see exactly what's happening. So that was probably the most common question that was asked. The second question that was asked was, you're using a welder. Welders put out DC. That's completely false. It makes the whole experiment useless. Well, to start with, my welder is a vintage welder. In the old days, before we had nice high power, cheap silicon diodes, all welders pretty much spit out a nice AC current. And the reason they did that is it was cheaper. Probably if you had an industrial welder that was extremely expensive, you might be able to get something else. But the welder I'm using is AC. Well, okay, what is the difference between AC and DC in this sort of an application? Well, a number of people mentioned something like the skin effect or the skin depth. And what the skin depth is, is for a particular frequency, it's how far the current actually penetrates into the wire. And the skin depth for 60 hertz, the frequency of the mains voltage in Canada and the US and a few other places, the skin depth is about eight millimeters. So somewhere a bit less than half an inch. It's not very much, but that is way beyond the radius of these wires in number 12 or number 14 house wiring. So from a skin depth perspective, there is no difference between AC and DC in wires of this thickness. The entire wire is used. So, so much for the skin depth argument. I will, however, tell you a significant difference between the DC and AC situation for wires like this, and that is the ability to extinguish an arc if it forms. An arc is a nice big spark that occurs when you have two wires close to each other or touching and then move them apart and the current starts jumping between them like a little bolt of lightning. Well, for DC, it's actually very hard to extinguish the arc and it is so hard to extinguish the arc because the current never stops. In AC, the current goes up and then it goes down and essentially stops and then goes up and down and that up and down and close to stopping situation really makes it a bit easier for the arc to cool down just a bit and stop. And if you look at things like switches, you'll find those that are rated for DC have typically significantly lower voltage and or current ratings than that same switch when run on AC. So that would be the difference. So if I was doing this test with DC and an arc did form in a wire 
after the insulation melted and things shorted, you could have a considerably more catastrophic result than with AC. The truth is, in a real-world application, you would hope a circuit breaker stopped everything way before an arc got going to any significant extent. And for that matter, that might be one legitimate criticism of this, a real-world situation, your circuit breaker hopefully catches things before they get anywhere close to this bad. So, for that matter, why are we then doing this test? Well, we want to see what that safety margin is. It would be no good at all if this wire, rated at 20 amps in this example, well, at 20.0001 amps suddenly vaporized. You want it to be significantly able to handle much higher currents and indeed it does in most situations. Now the interesting thing is in some of the tests and this is the criticism of the first one I did which was it's not a realistic situation the wire is just out in the open well in many of those tests I built a section of fake 2x4 stud wall and in some cases I put the wire through insulation in some cases I didn't and well it does turn out that when it's in insulation as you would expect the overcurrent you can achieve before bad things happening goes down considerably so much so that I'd be actually kind of uncomfortable using wire in between insulation in a very hot attic at close to its rated current I'd probably up gauge the wire by at least well one notch so 14 would become number 12, for instance. So that's perhaps the biggest criticism why these tests are not completely realistic unless they are in a real-world type situation as I did in later tests. Another issue people had was me touching the wire with my fingers to see how hot it was during the tests and people were saying things like doesn't he know he could get electrocuted no regard for safety well the fact of the matter is i have a lot of respect for electricity and safety and in these tests as i previously mentioned i was running the wires at very low voltages typically four volts or three volts or something like that because it is a short circuit and if you had any more you'd have well, way too much current to be able to even do the test. Anyway, three or four volts and isolated from the power system, there is no concern about being electrocuted by touching the wires. Now, having said all of that, you still have to be careful. You want to make sure you understand what's going on and how the circuitry is set up so that you know it's safe. And the truth is, the bigger concern I had was having my fingers burnt where the wire got really hot. So the next thing we should do is take a quick look at a circuit diagram and do some calculations and I'll show you why in fact it doesn't really matter what the voltage is between the wires when all we're interested in for these tests is the amount of heating that is occurring along the wires or along the cable. So let's look at the circuit we're going to be dealing with and we'll start off by our power source over on the left here. So that's the power source and it could be the house wiring, it could be the transformer on the pole, it could be a generator, it could be my welder, it doesn't really matter. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some 14-2 wire from the source and we're going to connect that wire over here to the load. And that load is going to be, well, just about anything you want, but we'll model it as a nice big resistor to reflect the fact that it's going to be using power. And these copper wires here, well, they also have a resistance in them, so we will model them with a resistor as well, like that. There we go. Now, what are we going to use for these resistors? Well, let's pretend that the wire is something like 14 to wire. And I looked up the resistance of number 14 wire and it's 2.5 ohms per thousand feet. So we'll just maybe write that down here so we don't forget number 14 
is 2.5 ohms per thousand feet. Well, we're going to make things easy for ourselves and we're going to say this length here is 50 feet. So that means if we add this length and this length, we get 100 feet. So the round trip resistance of the wire is equal to 0 0.25 ohms. Or if we divide it equally between the top and bottom wires, it's going to be 0 0.125 ohms each. Okay, so now we know what the resistance of the wire is. Since it's number 14 wire, what we'll also do is say, well, let's play around with the maximum continuously allowed current in applications like houses. And so what we'll do is we will use a current of 12 amps for our calculations. Well, we can also go ahead and say, well, let's pretend the power source is 120 volts. And if we have 120 volts and the load is getting 12 amps and we multiply them together to get power, we get 1.44 kilowatts going into the load. All right. Well, we've got that much power going into the load. We've got 12 amps going through these resistors. Well, we can calculate what the voltage across each of these resistors is. And V equals I times R. So if we take 12 amps and we multiply it by 0.125 ohms, what do we get? We get a voltage drop of 1.5 volts across that resistor or in reality across the wire from where it connects here to where it connects over here. Similarly, because it's the same current, the voltage drop on the lower resistor or lower wire is also 1.5 volts. Okay, well, what that really tells us is this load is going to see 3 volts less than what the power source is spitting out. Is that really critical? Well, not in a case like this, because you often expect a power source, if it was 120 volts, to range anywhere from 115 to about 125 volts. So if we were at 120 volts and we subtracted 3, we'd end up with 117 here, which is, well, close enough. All right. Now, since we know what the voltage drop along this wire is, and we know what the current flowing through it is, we can take 1.5 volts, multiply it by 12 amps, and what do we get? We get 18 watts. So why don't we just say is loss equals 1.5 times 12 equals 18 watts. And same thing here, the power loss is 18 watts. So delivering 1.44 kilowatts to the load, we're losing about 2 times 18 watts in our cable. And this 2 times 18 watts in our cable is in fact what's heating up the conductors in the cable and melting the thermoplastic insulation. All right. That probably makes sense. Now, numerous people said, well, but that amount of heating in the cable depends on the voltage between the wires. Well, let's try another common voltage. Let's pretend our voltage from the power source is 240 volts and the current, well, it's a number 14 wire. So once again, we will use 12 amps as our current. And if we multiply 240 volts times 12 amps, what do we get? We get 2.88 kilowatts. All right.
So now we have twice the power going into the load as we did when we only had 120 volts between the cables. Let's do the calculation and see how much power is being lost as it flows through the cables. In other words, how much heating is going on in those cables? Well, it's still 12 volts. The resistance of those wires has not changed, so the drop is still 1.5 volts. And what that means is our wires are dissipating 18 watts each, or the whole cable is dissipating two times that. So even though we've changed the power source voltage and the load voltage to twice what it was before, the amount of heat that's being dissipated in the cables is the same. And that is in fact a good reason why we use higher voltage for long distance transmissions because by upping the voltage we can keep the current the same or reduce the current and reduce the losses in the cables. We can take that even to a more extreme example. Let's imagine we instead of using 120 volts or 240 volts decided to make a 12 volt system for some reason. Maybe it was filaments in an old tube radio. Maybe for some reason we're going to even have a 12 volt DC system running the lights on our off-grid house or even perhaps a DC powered pump. Well, once again we have 12 volts and we're going to stick to 12 amps going through the cable over here. And what happens if we multiply them together? Well, we get 0.144 kilowatts being delivered to the load, or 144 watts, much, much less power going to the load with the lower voltage. In fact, one-tenth the power that we get with a 120 volts. But, once again, what's the current in the wires? 12 amps. What's the voltage drop? along the wires, 1.5 volts each. What's the power being lost in the wires? 18 watts in each wire. Or for that matter, what's the heating that's going on in those wires? Well, 2 times 18 watts because it's two wires in the 14-2 cable. So the bottom line is, no matter what the voltage is between these wires, the only thing that matters in terms of heating of the wires is the voltage drop along the wires, which in turn is a result of the current through them and the resistance. And in this example, none of them have changed. So that's why when we're seeing what type of currents cause wires like 14.2 or 12.2 to melt, it really doesn't matter what the voltage is between those wires. All that matters is what the current through them is and that's why I could do those tests very nicely with very low voltages where essentially our load here is effectively shorted so there is close to really as well zero volts along this end depending on how good my connection between the wires is and therefore in this example we would have only three volts across the wires at the power source end if we wanted to push 12 amps through the system so I hope doing that worked example helps you understand what's going on here and why the ampacity of a cable really has nothing to do with the voltage that is allowed between the conductors on that cable. There is, of course, a restriction on that voltage, and that has to do with the insulation between the conductors, but that is a completely separate thing from the amount of current you're allowed to or should be passing through that cable. So that was a very quick explanation of the overcurrent tests I did. I hope you found them useful. I also posted, and I will have a link in the description of this video, a frequently asked questions page that goes into some of these things in further detail. I hope you found this useful. See you next time.